One of the things with ultra running that I'm realizing more and more is you gotta kinda have that crazy. If I can isolate other runners and make it a one-on-one -on -one, and we both go to dark place, I'm gonna win. In those low moments, I got this grinding gear that's just faster. I want to isolate other runners and make you run by yourself and me run by myself. And I'm going to put all my chips on me and just be like, not getting me. It's just been proven again and again and again at this point. I'm winning those battles. Maybe the motivation and the heart I've developed in the last year might not be there if I didn't have that wrong turn. <laughs> Brian Powell of I Run Far here with Jim Walmsley before the 2016 Western States 100. How are you, Jim? Doing great. So it's your first 100. Yeah. But you're also a competitive guy. I mean, like, is just finishing a goal? My goal is to win, period. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the goal with the side goal being I want to have a crack at the course record. Early on in the race, we get yeah. reports that Jim's ahead of pace that comfortable rhythm started leading to fast splits, which started rolling into course record pace, and it was turning into this magical, awesome running day. Go, man. See ya. Yep. You. Oh, yeah. The buzz was like insane. Everywhere you'd go, he's on a roll, is he gonna blow? Like people were just starting to really become like obsessed with how fast he's going. The gap that he was putting on on like the actual course record was huge. So it was definitely something historical about to happen. I first met James Bonet when I was a freshman going into high school. He was uh, just a standout freshman, and he, he's the only guy ever to beat me on my own team at Horizon out of all four years I ran. He kind of, from day one, was a guy I looked up to. I committed to the Air Force Academy for college. After you graduate from the Air Force Academy, you have a five-year commitment. My first base is Malmstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana. As a nuclear missileer, I work 24-hour shifts underground in a small room. It was a really bad lifestyle at the time. I was spending more and more time alone and not running. The first little hiccup was probably at Rocky Chucky River Crossing. I took one or two strokes with my hand on the rope and then just started swimming for it. Two strokes after that, I was getting swept down the river. I was still running scared, thinking that second place was right behind me. If I don't break the course record and I bonk, like, someone else is going to get the course record today. At mile 92, 93-ish, I ended up running past a, a turn I was supposed to make. I just blew right past it. The sun started to go down, and the time that Jim was expected started to tick on by. And then we looked down again, and 15 more minutes have gone by. And then all of a sudden, we're starting to really freak out, like, where is Jim? With the Air Force, uh, I started out on a bad foot when I first got to Montana. I was gonna go rock climbing, and essentially we get out there and we're like, hey, did you grab the rope? And I'm like, why would I grab the rope? It's your rope. All right, well, let's go back in town and let's just grab some beers. Starting to make our way back home around 8.39. I was super tired and just didn't feel comfortable driving. So I pull over, I decide to take a nap and I'll wake up and I'll start driving again in the morning and kind of get a tap on my window around like 2 a.m. I ended up blowing over a .08 because I was in the vehicle and I possessed the keys in my pocket. I got charged with the DUI. I was a second lieutenant with a DUI on their record. I was basically fighting my whole career with this black mark. And then a proficiency testing scandal surfaces at Malmstrom. Already having a black mark. That's what led to my separation in the Air Force. Being a young adult, I thought it was catastrophic. That just turned into these 
big depression. I started seeing psychiatrists getting suicidal. I couldn't drink at home by myself. I'd like beat myself up at night and just break stuff all the time and just really low places. It's just a hard place to of like isolation and being by yourself and knowing that if you had a quick way out, you would have totally taken it. Dude, what's up? He's f***ing lost. Am I on course? I just don't know if there's a torch in there. Yeah, I don't, the road isn't here. But down there is a uh, no hand bridge. Here, you're on the wall, Lindsay. You're all right, dude. Come on. Dude, you got it. You got plenty you're of time. Okay. Yeah, you're okay. Now I'm back by at least 15 minutes because I got to retract two miles, and it was just, I thought it was second place. I thought it was third place. And, I, and then if second and third are right there, I'm sure fourth is close. And it just turned into this absolutely demoralized, like, deflation immediately and and you feel you've been running through so much pain all day that it's like all right i'm gonna just take a deep breath and sit down for a second dude you got it still you got it dude you're so time, you're dude. so close just go well, yes yeah. yeah don't waste any more just start walking and go uh, i just stop being objective and competitive in how i was racing and it kind of became like you know, I'm just gonna kick this rock to the finish and a little pity party and in retrospect, like, yeah, I regret it. I wish I did race it in. You had an hour on him. You had an hour at the river. You had an hour. You could still be all right, man. Good luck, dude. My parents were just super supportive and kind of knew I'd been in a crappy place for a long time and stuff hadn't gone well since I moved to Montana. They were just exactly what parents needed to be. It was actually the psychiatrist that was like, I, I think you should start running and making that a priority in your life and and I think like I see that you're happier when you run and you go through bad spells when you don't get out the door and you don't go run. So it kind of became like just a medication. Close your eyes and know that I'll be coming back for you. After separating from the Air Force, I ended up in Flagstaff. Flagstaff was a time to hit the reset button to shape my life how I want it to be. I started running consistently. I started training again. Things have just started to take off from there. Three, two, one, I didn't really know many other runners when I first got to Flagstaff, but I started hopping in the local group runs. I eventually reconnected with Tim Frericks and his friend Cody Reed. Basically, we we're a bunch of young guys that got together and we wanted to run fast, we wanted to train really hard, and we wanted to have a lot of fun doing it. We started calling our little group the Coconino Cowboys. He's got the right mentality for this trail stuff. I think he can go out and, and run all day and just keep grinding. The, the dude is just insanely tough. He was that way in high school. I raced him in college too, and he's always been that way. But I think he's really come into his, his element on the trail. At that point, things really started rolling. I started to set my sights on some really big races. If I'm gonna get my name out there, I'm gonna make it happen at Western States. Technically, it's a 100 mile race, but it's so much more than that. James Bonet is 18 his senior year when he ran Western States, and he's just been absolutely pivotal in 
my learning curve towards ultra running. It just kind of helped me transition from this failure of how I viewed where I was at in my life to going forward and refocusing and then being encouraging. Just a really positive guy to be around at the time. Uh, mentally, he was a little broken down and, well, he was very broken down. And so we come in, I gave him a big hug and just said, it's all right, let's just finish this thing up. James is there just with a smile and just like, don't worry, we still are here for you. Let's get through this and let's finish it. Let's get it done. Mentally and physically, it just shut down. I know, it's okay. He's like, let's try to run. I'm like, not running. Let's try to walk. I'm like, slowly. And at the top of Roby Point, people just started gathering. Like, as, as we started walking on the roads, more and more people started joining in on like this shuffle back into town. And, and that kind of lifted his spirits, I think, a little bit. Most people don't know who, everybody's relation to me, but to me, that means so much because it's like, these guys got my back and I'm walking it in and I don't care. Like, I'm gonna finish today and I'll be back. Like, it doesn't matter. That moment would have never existed if not for a wrong turn. If anything, I think it's a bigger fire. It gives me more fight and more reason to keep grinding in those shitty moments. <laughs> Things have taken off in a way better and way more positive and way more adventurous and amazing way than I ever thought possible. It's kind of weird that a lot of ultra runners have had some really low depression that sparked this absolute crazy mental illness that they want to run 100 miles and run for a day at a time. I feel really, really blessed that I don't feel like it was a chronic depression. It was a phase or a time in my life that wasn't the prettiest, not my proudest, but it really steered me in a direction in life to reprioritize what's important. You hear the like cliche of like, do something you're passionate about and things will just work out. It's ridiculous that that's actually, it feels like that happened. I'll try again tomorrow, going harder in the paint steam. Now, approaching ultras and stuff, I think there's other runners um, that have struggled with depression and you hear their stories and stuff, and I, I don't necessarily talk to many people about it. That's just kind of my personality, but I think talking to someone about it is really important. It helps. All of a sudden, you bring someone else into the fight, problem solved, to help you, to be support. 